Behind the Badge, Illinois, giving you the inside scoop on public safety and those who protect and serve. Your real stories directly from law enforcement experts and get a chance to ask questions about issues you've always wanted to know more about. You have the right to remain informed. This is Behind the Badge, Illinois. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Behind the Badge, Illinois. I'm Lou Jogman, Chief of Police for Highland Park, taking us through today's episode. David Hochberg is enjoying a much-deserved day off. Uh, Our podcast is sponsored by Team Hochberg and the Illinois Association of Chiefs of Police. And joining me today on our panel are retired Illinois State Police Colonel Mimi McGreal. We've got Chief David Bird of the DeKalb Police Department and Chief Kirk Brumman from the O'Fallon Police Department, some of our regulars. Uh, And uh, I think today with everything that's going on in the world, and there is a lot going on in the world, um, there's a lot going on in re- with respect to polling. That was kind of an interesting topic. So we thought we'd talk about that today. We'll talk about some polling. But more specifically, we're going to talk about a recent Pew Research survey uh, that came out on the public's confidence in U.S. institutions. Uh, they've been doing the survey for quite some time, and, and they just released this year's. And their findings kind of are, in, are, are interesting. They show um, U.S. confidence in public institutions are mostly flat, but police are up. So we're happy to hear that, right? Everybody here, I think, is happy to see and hear that. Uh, average confidence in institutions remains historically low, unfortunately. And uh, I'm going to pull it up right now and show everybody kind of what we're talking about. All right. So... Here's the poll, and I think it's interesting, and we'll go around around the room here in a second. But um, let's just let's just take a look at it. You can see that you know this poll kind of hits 17 U.S. institutions, and they you know kind of rate and decide what kind of um, confidence people have in those institutions. You know, quite a de- quite a bit, a great deal, some very little, and you'll see that number one is small business. Small business definitely rates uh, the highest. And then second, you see the military. And then in third, you see the police. And I think that's certainly very telling. And as you go down, you can see some of the other institutions that they've rated. You've got higher education, the medical system. You've got church to organize religion, Supreme Court, public schools, organized labor. You've got large tech companies, some banks. You've got the presidency, criminal justice system overall which rates uh, lower, which is interesting. So as us part of that, um, we rate a little bit higher or a lot higher. We got newspapers, big business, television news, and Congress dead last. So, I mean, it is a very interesting um, look at what people, how they feel about these institutions that really are present in their life, you know, every day. Uh, So uh, Mimi, start with you. What are your thoughts about this? So I think it's pretty interesting. I mean, I I think that um, you know this the the how how they're ranking it seems pretty interesting to me. I should say, um, and I do feel that you know a lot of the a lot of what um, people base this on is what they're hearing in the media too. Like I do feel like that. Like that's it, someone you're always reading social media. You're always reading something in in the media. So I definitely think the media plays a huge role in influence, influencing people and what they, you know, what they hear and see. So I always say that because, you know, sometimes you, you don't, you know, you, you want to trust everything that you read, but we all know that that's not true. So I do think the influence comes there. As far as the police, I think, you know, that's really good to see um, the police. I think that we've just, we've made you know, great strides in getting better, improving, holding ourselves accountable. I think that's a huge deal that that we're we're trending towards. You know, holding our officers accountable, and um, and I so I I'm happy to see that that we're that we're number three, and that you know, and and those uh, what people feel about us. Yeah, I think it's interesting, uh, David. I think it's interesting. That to Mimi's point, you know, television news and um, and newspapers, where a lot of people still get their their information and, and a lot of about police, they're ranked really low. So uh, is that affecting their impression of the police? Maybe some of the uh, the the way they present the stories or not? Because it, I don't know if people have a lot of confidence 
Um, it, it appears by this that lower confidence, but I mean, what do you think the role is in that? Yeah. So, I mean, it is uh, that the fact that the, the television news is so low is, you know, that is kind of conflicting a little bit because if it's so low and maybe they're not following that, maybe I believe social media has been the biggest uh, information, you know, input area for most people because, you know, people believe, you know, you have to actually talk to people. I talk to my kids about this. They believe everything on the internet is true. I'm like, oh my God, guys. I mean, like, so, I mean, if people are following that, uh, you know, and using that as their guideline or their, uh, you know, it, it it says a lot about what so, the impact that social media has had because I truly believe people believe everything they read on the internet. It's, uh, well, you know, I mean, there are people like us who know better, but there are also a lot of people who don't. So, um, you know, and people have, you know, the one thing about, especially when you look at the law enforcement institution, uh, police, uh, how many people are really, some people have never had interaction with the police at all. So, they're definitely gauging theirs off of someone, a third party or somebody else's, uh, you know, interaction that they have read or have heard. Uh, you see that all the time uh, because some people just truly haven't had police contact. So they really don't know how to gauge this. Um, the thing that's shocking to me is that, you know, through the years, not so much ranking the institution, they used to rank it by profession or and law, I mean, police officers used to always be, I mean, actually be pretty low. Firemen were always ahead of us. Um, uh, the, uh, you know, the nursing field, you know, would be ahead of us. We would always struggle when they actually rank the profession, you know, uh, instead of more like the institution. And uh, so I'm, I'm happy to see that we've moved up, uh, at least in the confidence rate. Uh, but to your point, uh, Lou, this is like, I mean, this is ever changing. This is fluid. Uh, you know, I mean, I think if you go back and look at, you know, the, the same ranking, maybe back uh, during the time of the Rodney King incident, uh, I'm sure the confidence level had to be pretty low at that time, you know. So uh, so I think it is uh, peaks and valleys for us. And But I will say that, you know, the fact that we're, I know here in DeKalb, we do a lot of community engagement. So we are making contacts with people that we normally would not make contact with properly, uh, meaning that we're not making contact in a law enforcement, uh, you know, in a law enforcement posture. No one, there's no enforcement. We're not coming for calls of service to your home or your residence. Uh, we're actually engaging you in the community. And that's probably the only time that some of the residents have had contact with law enforcement and when they and during this time is is extremely favorable because we're not taking one into anyone into custody and i think that also helps our approval rate as well and and the confidence in law enforcement uh because we're doing so much more with uh true true community engagement um and it's making a difference so. yeah i i think you had a, an interesting couple of interesting points but one one that's interesting to me uh chief Roman is they measure police and they measure law enforcement um, in general, the criminal justice system, but they don't have fire included in this or public works or a lot of different, um, you know, entities in, in in government. So I guess I'd ask you what, what your thoughts are on that. But, you know, in general, what are your thoughts on, on this poll this survey? Oh, I, I think fire was so low that they just didn't want to put them on the actual <laughs> thing make... to, to embarrass them. I mean, that's kind of a normal thing. You know, I look at this and it doesn't really surprise me because I've seen what we as a profession, what police have been doing these last 25 years as I've come into the, uh, I've been in, I've been in policing for 25 years and, and I've just seen a change and a shift in, um, in professionalism, in community outreach. Uh, it, it wasn't, it wasn't very common for be for the police to be out in those out in the communities 25 30 years ago and now it's the norm um it's the norm to see big police departments you know buying food trucks and and bringing ice cream into cities and we had a pop up barbecue in one of our communities two nights ago and it's all of those positive outreaches um along with you know advances in technology um you know um with all of the things with all the great things that we're doing out there 
you know, there's still bad things happening to people. And with our advances in technology and staying on top of things, we're able to solve more crimes. We're able to bring justice, um, to bring closure to victims, to provide victims with advocacy that I don't think were there many, many years ago. So where we do have some bad actors and we work to weed them out, I think as a, as a whole, um, policing has made great strides to to get so much better and to move forward and and I really think because of the public because of what they expect of us um, sometimes it looks like it's a little slower that we're making changes but I really feel like policing makes changes pretty quickly uh, in the grand scheme of things um, when things go wrong um, police are pretty quick to try to fix those mistakes and move forward and try to make change for the better. Um, some people may disagree with that, uh, but, uh, you know, I've seen things take a, take a very long time to make change. And I believe that police uh, have done a pretty good job and, and we have a, a long way to go, but I, I really think we're on, on the right path. Yeah, good point. Um, interestingly, so, and, and I know, I think Dave brought it up, so Gallup first measured confidence in police in 1993. And so between then and 2019, a majority of Americans expressed high confidence in the institution, including a record high of 64% in 2004. As mentioned, faith in police fell in 2020 to 48% after George Floyd was murdered while in police custody. So after increasing to 51% in 2021, Confidence in police dropped again in 2022 and dipped further last year to a record low of 43. So I'm not sure exactly, you know, how that went or why that went. But over the past year, confidence in the police has risen uh, among most major demographic subgroups. It rose the most, particularly um, amongst um, some areas where there were low, lower levels of confidence in the police, those aged 18 to 34, people of color and political independence. So I put up on the screen kind of a trend um, for Gallup, you know, and you look off to the right, um, you'll see the numbers, I mean, they're fairly static. I mean, over the years, 2001, 57, 59, 61, they go up, they ebb, they flow. And then, yeah, I think when you have those critical incidents, um, you know, you have those going on, certainly you can mark those on here to see, but even, I mean, when we pop back to the other one, uh, even when you go back, so 43%, you know, uh, you, you look at that and it still would put us up in the higher group. So no matter what, we're still up there in law enforcement. But I think my next question and, and what I find somewhat interesting and I'm not sure how, how to take it is, you know, how, how is this having an effect on our recruitment and retention? So you look back at those years, let me pop it back up. It does, it shows, um, you know, it lists all the years and you can go back uh, to when they start, but just looking at 2001 and 02, 03, 04, you can see it goes 57, 59, 61, 64, 63. It dips down to 58 to 54. So it's really all around there, 59, 59, 56, 56, it's, it hovers. But then yeah, in 2020 and, and after it went down pretty significantly to 48, and I think the interesting thing is, again, from an all-time high of us at 64, now in 2023, you know, we dipped to 43. And then now we're back up to 51. So we're starting on that trend again. But I guess, so my question is, um, you know, 43% uh, in 2023, which is pretty recent. And, uh, you know, three years after George Floyd, it, it went down. I mean, from... 48 down to 43 over those three years. So what do you take, make of that? And again, we bounced back here uh, this last year to 51, but Dave, what do you think? Why, you know, over the last three years, why would it have continued to go down, you know, from that pivotal moment in, in uh, the criminal justice uh, history? Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think one thing for me, at least personally, is that, um, I think we had to change culturally as a culture shift for law enforcement. Um, and I think we, after George Floyd, I mean, it was so much attention uh, on this incident. Um, like I said, you hadn't seen anything probably this egregious probably since, like I said, probably since Rodney King. I, I worked, of course, I was on the job during that time. So to me, I, I think it was just a cultural shift for law enforcement. 
you know, we see some of the changes that were made within legislation. I mean, like I said, although we don't agree with all of everything that occurred with the Safety Act, uh, of course, you know, basically with the bail bond issue and all those things that we made changes in, I, I think uh, some of that uh, affected it, I, I think in general. Uh, but, it's, you know, we talk about recruitment and retention. I think uh, we've done way more than we've ever done in recruiting, meaning that uh, especially with social media, with the uh, with the, those social media push, getting on TV, getting on the radio, uh, law enforcement, you, you know, on billboards, everywhere you look at buses. I mean, any way that we can push, uh, you know, you know, police retention and recruitment, we've been doing. Uh, there have been bonuses that have been out there. So a lot of different things that we've been able to take advantage of to help recruitment. Um, I know I still see a a you know a, a uptick in uh candidates uh, putting in applications to be law enforcement officers here in DeKalb I haven't had a, you know any setbacks there at all it doesn't look like uh, we're just opening up our cycle again uh because we just ran through our list because you know and it you know I'm looking forward to seeing what this looks like uh you know we I think culturally we you know at least here in DeKalb I can I can speak with complete confidence that uh, the law enforcement uh, entity here um, has been doing an amazing job, uh, making sure that people understand that you know we are here for them, that we are truly standing on our oath and living our creed. And I think it's made a difference. And and people uh, have come here and want to be police officers. So I'm, I'm very happy to see that. But it's more of a you know the thing is we, you know culturally as the law enforcement profession. We had to make some real changes. We had to look ourselves in the mirror and say, hey, well, how can we get better? And I think we've made some serious changes, um, but there's still a lot to do. I mean, it's obvious. Um, I mean, we just had this uh, Sonia Massey shooting incident. Um, and and uh, and I will tell you that, uh, and Mimi knows this, that it, had, it, you know, it really affected me adversely, um, you know, watching that incident. I probably watched that video too many times and uh, and not to get off topic, but I, I think it's important that people know that we understand that we still have a long way to go in you know in vetting candidates and making sure that the right people wear this uniform. So and uh, and I'm just going to be honest that I mean that did affect me. This whole whole week ever since I watched it Monday has been a, a different week for me personally. But but we you know but you get through it. And you just, you know, and I feel like we're in the right direction. I think, uh, like Kirk said, we're doing a lot of good things. We're moving in the right direction. I hope it'll affect uh, recruitment in a positive way. Uh, you know, we, and, and I will say this again, uh, you know, uh, African-Americans are not putting in for this job still. Uh, they, you know, um, and we, so we have to do our part in making sure that people truly see the cultural change that we're making in law enforcement to at least you know get them in a position where they feel comfortable and and they have the confidence in law enforcement to actually apply for these jobs. So I mean it's an important point Dave and I, and I know uh, as you know we were experiencing this over the last couple of years this recruitment retention issue and how dire it was um and I'll, I'll ask you Mimi if what your thoughts are on this you know, we talked about the Illinois Chiefs, and our concern was as we were starting to see um, fewer and fewer candidates put in, and we've talked about this on other podcasts, our concern was, yeah, the quality of the candidates that we're going to start seeing uh, and ultimately being forced to hire because we have to have people in the squad cars uh, was going to be diminished, and then that would maybe perhaps lead to um, more incidents in the street because maybe these are people who shouldn't be police officers, never should have been. And again, with respect to this case um, that Chief Bird brought up, I mean, I, I don't know that that's at play here, but I mean, it was a concern of ours that it was going to be this kind of um, cycle then, you know, people were concerned about the police and we have police officers, you know, in our field that may make bad decisions and, and do bad things. And then we hold them accountable, which then, brings the public's concern up and then they want to make sure it doesn't happen again. So they start applying, you know, different kind of uh, pressure and different things to law enforcement, which then unfortunately might've resulted in some uh, 
at a reduction in people who wanted the job. And then by virtue of that, now you've got people getting into the job that maybe shouldn't and then do more things like, and so it seems like that could be this cycle, which was a concern of ours, you know? And so we're working through that to try to hire the best people, certainly. But, you know, when you're down and we talked about it, you know, a, a, a test that we used to give years ago up here in Chicago Metro drew 3000 people for one process, that same test brought 57. So, I mean, that will tell you, and we know this, okay, are those 57, you know, out of 3,000, you're going to find some good candidates. So, Kirk, you got something there? Oh, I was going to, no, go ahead. Help, no, that's help. right. I'm, I'm good. I was oh, doing, uh, you know, well, I, I think, I think to your point there, uh, when you look at this Gallup poll, there is, uh, they, they talk about the subgroups uh, in Americans' conf confidence in the police and the 18 to 34 uh, year, year age, those are the people that were, wanting to be police officers, 18 to 34. From 2023 to 2024, they were 27% to 43%. They are by far the lowest of all of the subgroups. Obviously, 55 and an older, 35 to 54, they have higher confidence in the police, but we're not hiring anybody over 55 to be a new police officer. So when I look at this study, in and those that's the thing that jumps out at me, is for recruitment and retention, the confidence in police has to be high in that 18 to 34 year age. Those are the people, if you if they don't have a great deal or quite a lot of confidence in the police, why do they want to be the police? So, you know, um, you know, if they if they don't have confidence, their friends may not have confidence, that's then it's not looked at as a noble profession that we all know it is and we all believe it is and that we all preach it is. Um so when I look at that, it's like, how do we change that perception? How do we get those numbers up? Because I think those numbers come up and we, we reach that 18 to 34, then I think our recruitment, our retention will, will go up because that's what it was for me when I got into policing. I grew up, I saw police officers. I had a high confidence in police officers. I think, you know, years ago, kids, looked at it they wanted to be cops they wanted to be out and they wanted to help and they wanted to save people um that's not happening quite as much especially when you're getting into that 18 to 34 year old age so i think that's a that's a concern moving forward i think that's an excellent i mean excellent point i i would have you know i would have normally not gone to you because i worry what you're going to say sometimes in all honesty <laughs> but that was actually you know so but that was actually really good and Encouragingly, you know, again, looking at my notes, um, over the past year, confidence in the police has risen most, mo among most demographic subgroups, particularly three that express lower levels of confidence in the past, those 18 to 34 people. So that bodes well for us. And I mean, that's a really astute observation on your part, um, because those are the people, yeah, that we're going to be trying to get to walk through the door and, and, and commit to a life of service. And it also, it's interesting, so Mimi, I'll go back to you and whatever you want to address in all of this, but interesting because where are they getting most of their news or influence about police? It's probably social media, right? I mean, they're not watching the 10 o'clock news like we all grew up on. Um, they're probably getting it from social media, so that's going to play a really big role. But anything uh, that was just brought up that speaks to you that you want to talk about? So, yeah, I, I do feel like we're constantly chasing the, you know, what, what should we do next? What should we do next? You know, should we, should we uh, pay more money, pay their salary more money? I know the state police just recently did that because you're trying to keep up with recruitment. And I do feel that over the years, it, it definitely is the numbers have gone down with recruiting. I mean, I think we see it across the board, but I think that has a lot to do with social media influence, you know, on whether or not we'll, we'll get candidates that want to be the police. You know, this is this, I've always said, this is a calling. It's not just a job that you, you have to want to do this. And, um, and also I think like, I'll ask my own kids, you know, do you think you'll ever be a police officer? And the first thing they say is, well, I don't want to die. And so like, I think there's certain things when, you know, you'll have, for example, you know, Ella French, when, when, uh, when she was killed, um, you know, I think women in general are like, you know, that was a, that was such a, a terrible situation there. And, and I, I remember my daughter saying, oh, I don't know if I could ever be the police, like, because they saw that. So I think that there's certain elements that come into play 
on on why people don't why we don't get those high numbers. I think it, it's a it's a several things. You know, um, when the confidence isn't there, I definitely I agree that you know, why would they want to be the police? Because I think that when it's, when we're praised and when we're, you know, you hear a lot of good things, um, you'll get the younger generation to say, oh, you know, that's something that I would want to do. So I think, you know, for, for all agencies, you know, it, it's such a noble pr profession. There's so much responsibility on us in every aspect of, of the job. There's just so much that goes with it that, you know, and there's a lot of great things police officers do out there, too. And from, you know, agencies across the country that I don't think you we we hear enough. Um, and, you know, I think that there's just a there, we're constantly trying to figure out the strategy right on how to, re, you know, retain and recruit. And I, I don't think we'll ever get away from that. I think we're going to still, we have to keep up with the, with what's going on and how to fix things and how to make it better. I think we're always going to be doing that. But that's yeah. really an industry thing as well. You know, I mean, I think uh, re retention is, is, is a problem in all industry. It's not like it was uh, with our parents uh, where they would find a job, they would settle down and they would stay and they would get a pension. Um, you're seeing a lot more movement uh, with the younger generations, um, it's 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 normal to go to a job for two years and then move somewhere else and then move on to something else to move complete industries to change from banking to policing to mm -hmm. uh, to anything else. So uh, it's a, it's a challenge. Uh, I'm up for it. I love it. It's actually it makes it makes my job hard, uh, but it makes it fun and interesting every day to try to figure out new things to do. Yeah, and I and I'll just say this, you know, when it comes to recruitment, I. I've just noticed and just going to grad uh, cadet graduations and, and uh, recruitment graduations that one of the things that I have seen and way more than I, you know, when I look at it and I'm just doing my own poll just by watching going through these, it's unofficial, but there are more uh, when it comes to uh, white males, you see their kids becoming police officers. You don't see that with black males, black police officers. You don't see it. I go. I went to the last couple of graduations down in Macon County, and the, and every time there's a, a officer who who graduates, if their dad or their loved one is a police officer, and you know who's uh, either retired or active, they're the ones who come and put the badge on them. And I sat there and watched, and I'm telling you, it was the whole time it was a white male, white male, white male, you know, and you didn't see that for the you know so. And I know this to be true because I, I think I spoke on this before, that my brother and I are both high-ranking police officers, and we've been doing it our whole our whole life. I have a nephew that's a, a Chicago cop. But none of the younger boys in our family want to be police officers, which is unbelievably shocking to me. Because we have a, a lot of boys, and normally they, you know, they follow, at least follow in their dad's footsteps, most most kids do. Uh, you know, and when I see that, I, I, that, that told me a lot about where we are in law enforcement, at least when it comes to African Americans and, and people who live in urban areas, they just don't want to do this job there. Their lack of confidence in law enforcement is that it's extremely high. I mean, they, they don't, they don't have the same confidence and, I can tell you now, my daughter, I've been having a conversation with my daughter all week. And it, like I said, reverse back to the, this whole uh, Sonia Massey shooting. And she told me, and I, I've shared this with Mimi, that she's scared to call the police. And my daughter grew up in a law enforcement profession. When she was born at the hospital, Mimi, all these cops came to visit her when she was a baby. She has, she She doesn't know anything but law enforcement her whole life. And now she's 27 years old and she said, dad, I'm truly afraid to call the police. So that's that's a different truth than what some people have experienced. And I know my experience are different because where I grew up at and, and where I worked at my whole career, and Mimi knows this as well, because we worked in the city of Chicago and it's a different experience. And it's, and, and it's, and it's a different truth in Chicago when it comes to policing. So. Uh, we just have to be mindful not to lose sight of that as well. 
Thanks, and, Dave. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, Dave, it's heartbreaking to hear that. Yes. I mean, the whole story was heartbreaking. And, you know, again, I think not, I can't say with certainty, but I, the concern we have is, you know, this this circle, this cycle. We, we were worried about this in 2017, 18 and 19. We want to hire but nothing but the best honorable people with integrity because all it takes is one person like that and, and look at the profound impact now on people across the country. And that for people who do this job and really do it and mean it and, and want to help and protect, you know, it's heartbreaking. Um, so, you know, interestingly, though, back to the numbers, you know, you look at the military, they they rank very high almost all the time. And they're still having these same recruitment issues we are, you know? So I think maybe to Kirk's point too, and, and Dave, I mean, it might be a generational thing too, because, you know, they're enjoying a pretty good um, support rate rating and they have traditionally, and yet they are really struggling like we are. Um, so it may really speak to just this generation. Um, but at, at the end of the day, because of the consequences and, and potential ramifications of bad police interactions like this one that just happened, horrible, horrific, and, and the implications, you know, we we do have to keep committing and recommitting to hiring the best, finding the best. I just, I know we're worried because we look around and people are 10 down, some big cities 500 down, and, and you've got a police. And so ugh, it's that balance. Well, who are you going to put in that car? I, did I hear this right? Is, is San Francisco offering uh, like paying four hundred thousand dollars to a salary to get people to stay or something like that? I read an article. I, I know it's expensive out in San Francisco, but man, I, I just read that somewhere. And I mean, you wow. do see these crazy numbers, but you know, is money going to be the right incentive? You know, I don't know. You know, who, who people want money, but are you going to get the right person? Um, all right, so just pivoting. You know, you've all been in the business long enough. I think let's talk about this pendulum thing that we're all familiar with, you know, how it does ebb and flow and does this, do these numbers, do the um, changing uh, moods of society, how, how does that impact the average officer? And I know they're probably not reading these um, surveys, right? I did send it to my team because I wanted them to see, you know, we're doing okay and keep doing good work. But, you know, this pendulum, I know in, in my world, you see policing over the years and when big events happen and police do well, 2001, you know, when you had 9-11, there is a surge of support, right? And we enjoy that support when it comes in. But then, yeah, conversely, when we don't do our best work or when we do something uh, poorly, then, of course, that support ebbs. And so there is this pendulum. And what, what you see is when we're doing well, um, you know, in crime fighting and community relations, uh, you know, we get a little more leeway from people and, but then something bad happens and then, you know, we go over here and they start creating new laws, reforms and things like that. And it kind of does this back and forth. And then some of those reforms might be counterproductive to law, good law enforcement. So crime might start ticking up again. And so then people are like, Hey, we need you back out there. So I guess speak to this like back and forth. Uh, Dave, I'll start with you. I mean, what have you seen? You've been here probably, I think the longest out of all of us, you started what year? 89. Yeah, you got me beat. So uh, you've seen it longer than all of us. So what, do you, what are your thoughts on that, the pendulum? Yeah, so I mean, you know, when I talk about it, I guess, um, you know, I always speak in confidence of only two agencies because I can really, with certainty, I can only speak on those two because Illinois State Police, where I spent, of course, you know, way more than, you know, 31 and a half years or whatever, and then the three years I've been here at DeKalb. So I, you know, I only speak of, in confidence uh with, with those two departments. Uh and 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 I have seen that. I mean, um, you know, the back and forth, uh, the, like you said, it's so it's a roller coaster ride. I mean, to your point, I mean, it's it's, it's constantly, it's like, you know, we have our peaks and our valleys, and and you know, and 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 when it comes to at least here in the city of DeKalb. The one thing I can say is things have been on the up and up here. Like when I and I mean that because when I got here, um, we were uh, staffing levels were at fifty. We were fifty two strong, and that's including me as chief. And now we're up at seventy, you know, and we're on our way to eighty. So, and these are all. I mean, these are all like all time high in staffing levels uh, for the DeKalb Police Department. I mean, I I think uh, at least. For, just from the guys here who told me, they said, well, Chief, we've, we've really never been over 62 for any length of time. 
uh, in this in this department was established in 1856. So it's been a long time. Uh, and but that you know you know this you know this city has needed that. Uh, and one of the first things uh, the city manager asked me is, "Hey Dave, what do you think the staffing level should be to run this department effectively, where they can be proactive?" And, and make an impact here in the city. I said, you need at least 80, 80 we gotta be at least 80 strong. And he said, okay. So we've been working our way to that number and it's been effective. These guys, are, uh, I, I will tell you, they love coming to work every day. And that's, and a lot of that um, is my responsibility as chief of police is to make sure that I have an environment here that they wanna come to work every day. Not just them, but the civilians as well. And that and everything that I do uh, within this four walls is about them being happy. Is whatever I can do for them, I will do. I don't, you know, we same thing. I support them for the salary uh, increases. Anything that I think that's going to make this profession um, at least more, in, you know, not just enjoyable but beneficial for them and their families, I've been doing. So we are on an incline here in DeKalb. I'm sure there are other departments who might be in the opposite direction um, based on what you already said, Lou, about some of the recruitment. I have not had been in a position at one at any point to like take an officer or candidate that I didn't feel comfortable with. I've been able to say no. I, we've, we have been vetting so hard uh, with our candidates. I, I will tell you, when I came on the job in 1989, the ISP weren't even taking, if you have one citation or they weren't taking those people. I mean, like it was, it was, it, I mean, you had to be as, I mean, you had to be a boy scout to get on with the state police in 1989. They, they didn't have to, they were like, look, I list when they called me, they said, son, do you want this job or not? I said, I said, you know, Hey, can I call my mom? And I want to talk to her, you know, cause I was in college and, and I was still at, uh, I hadn't graduated. I had a couple of semesters or semester left to do. And he said, son, I don't have time for that. He's like, either you want the job or you don't. And, and I knew personally, I knew that he had a list of, I was like number whatever on this list. And he was just going to be like scratch next, next, next. So I said, you know what? No, I'll take it. I'll take this job. And, and, you know, and I knew that to be true. Now that list is so short. I mean, we went through a list of candidates. I think I had 30, 32. And, and I tell you, when they started doing the soft internal uh, backgrounds on these guys, I mean, that list went down like half within a day or two. I mean, they were like, chief, we can't take him. We can't take him. We can't take him. He's got this in his background. He's got this in his background. He, he's done this. He has a domestic battery. We, we can't take him, you know. And before you know it, I mean, this list has been exhausted and I really haven't gotten, I think I maybe have, I got one one person in the academy right now, Lou, and that list was started up in around 32. So see how fast we have rolled through this list because we are being very uh, selective when we make our selections about who we want to put in this uniform. And I'm, thank God, I'm happy that I'm in a position where I don't feel the pressure of taking a body just to have a body. And one of the other things that, and that I did was I, I would go to roll call and I asked them specifically. I said, what do you, I say, in my opinion, the quality matters more than the quantity. I was like, but I want to hear from you guys. And they told me exactly the same thing. They said, chief, we rather have the best candidate. We don't care about just having a body in a squad car. That does us no good. We can't trust this person. There might be an integrity issue that we're going to have to constantly be watching every day. And they said, Chief, just fight the fight, go through the, uh, the process, and you and we'll just stand put until we get to the levels where we need to be at. So, so I appreciate them because they've been supporting me through this, and uh, and it's been going a long way, Lou. So it's good, it's good. All right, um, so we're going to be wrapping up because I know Mimi, you're going to be jumping off. So I'll I'll real quickly ask uh, either uh, Mimi or or Chief Brogelman, any kind of last thoughts, anything that you want to throw out there on well, this topic? I think it's important to see that um, last night I was probably in one of the 
probably one of the highest concentrations of extreme confidence in the police, uh, the 55 plus. Uh, I might be a little weathered today because last night I was at a rock concert. Uh, Mr. Barry Manilow wow. was in St. Louis. Uh, so needless to say, uh, I think that they had a real high confidence in police at that place. I felt very welcome. Very in, safe. In very Manilow concert. So you're sorry. Are you mellow today? I mean, you take I it down, am. take your blood pressure down a little bit. <laughs> All right. Mimi, anything before we head out? No, I think we just have to keep pushing and just, you know, yeah, you know, we, I think vetting, like what Dave said is so, so important. Like, cause we, like, we want, we want the best candidates. We don't, we don't want to have to deal with, you know, choosing someone that we later find out should never have been wearing the badge because it has such an effect on, like you said, Lou, across the country. I mean, one, it affects all of us all the time when, when something goes wrong. And, and so I just think we, as departments, you know, you just have to continue to, to vet as much as you can and, and follow and, and see what should I do next? You know, the challenge, like Kirk said, it's a challenge. It's definitely a challenge. It's an everyday challenge for yeah. sure. And I'll add one more thing. You know, you talk about the pendulum sh shifting, you know, uh, from high to low to high to low. And, and, and I try to, I see that that happens and it has an effect on big scale things. It has an effect on some legislation within our state, but ultimately I try to keep it local with our local agency, our local community. And, and I remind our officers that we have a wonderful community that respects us, that looks up to us, and that we're here to serve. And I would just challenge uh, people in the community um, out there to get to know your police department, to attend your Citizens Police Academy, to see what's going on out there, to interact with them outside of, of routine law enforcement, uh, you know, um, talk to them, go to their different community events. Like I said, the CPAs are a wonderful way to get to know your police department, to know what's happening in your police department. I always say that police departments will police that community based upon that community's expectations. Everybody's different. There are thousands of police departments all over the country. So um, I think there's a mutual responsibility between the public and the police to interact, to talk about things, to figure out what's important. And I think if that happens, and you can meet in the middle there, then I think that that confidence will go up. Maybe not nationally. I mean, it will nationally at some point, but realistically, as local police leaders, we need to be focused on what's going on in our communities. And that's what I think is the most important is focusing on what's important with our community and how am I policing my community and what do they expect from us and how do they feel? about how we're doing. So I look at those kind of polls a little bit more than the national polls. Yeah, and I, I good points. And, and uh, you know, again, I'm confident we're moving in the right direction. Our numbers are up. This poll is very um, encouraging. It, it bodes well for us. We're, we're definitely on an upswing. We've got a lot of work to do. We all know that. Um, but I think we're up for the challenge. All right, before we go, I've got a couple quick polls for everybody. So we'll just go quickly around the horn. Uh, we'll just go uh, Dave first, and then um, Mimi, and then Kirk. So, Dave, dogs or cats? All dogs. Mimi? Dogs. Cats. I'm a dog guy. All right. Cats. So you're on that. Um, Although, we have a dog at the police department, but I have cats at home. So. You're a cat guy. All right. All right. Um, glass half full or half empty, Dave? Oh, always full. All right, Mimi? Always full. Kirk? Full. All right, me too. So we're good there. All right, vacation or staycation, Dave? Staycation for me. You staying home? All right, yeah. Mimi? I'm going to say vacation because when I staycation, all I'm doing is working around the house. <laughs> all right, Kirk? <laughs> vacation. Love national parks. Yeah, I'm a staycation guy, so we're split on that one. All right, movie theater or streaming? I don't know if anybody's going to movie theaters anymore. What do you think, uh, Dave? Movie theater. I'm going today, hopefully. Me and my Ooh. son. Yeah. So. Old school. All right. Margaret? Yeah. Movie theater. Okay. Yeah. We still love going to the show. Uh, I'm a streaming. I'd rather sit on the couch and watch it <laughs> so I can <laughs> pause it and go to the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all about that too. Comfort, comfort. All right. Last one. I, I hope I know the answer to this one, but I'll be surprised. Police officer or firefighter? Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Do I have to ask? Hey, I was I was a firefighter twenty something years ago, a volunteer. Obviously, I chose correctly. There you go. Hey, bo all day, all day long. Yep. I, I forgot Definitely. That. Hey, 
the the fire the firefighter needs a hero too so that's why we're here that's, that's <laughs> right. right well had i known that kirk i think i forgot that we may have uh, vetted you out of this conversation but... <laughs> all right well everybody really appreciate being on today really interesting topic um thank you thank you for uh you know helping us work our way through that and again uh, you know, really want to thank David Hochberg for uh, co-sponsoring this with the Illinois Association of Chiefs of Police. Uh, everybody enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. All right. You too, guys. Thanks, right. everyone. Stay safe.